said, I think you may have like body dysmorphia. Loads of people online were just like cyber bullying me, like calling me out for my lips at that point. Though I'd already done an hour on the treadmill, I wanted to go again in the afternoon and do an hour. It was obsessive. It was toxic and my self-worth was like diminishing. I was in my mid-30s before I realised that negative emotion was just information to respond to. I'd been through a toxic relationship but I was also suffering with body dysmorphia. No practitioners during that point would ever say, no, I'm not treating you, they kept just treating me. If you've got obsessive thoughts that crop up every day, you're probably on the spectrum mm -hmm. of body dysmorphia. This week, I have a really interesting topic and a very interesting guest who I know you're going to learn a huge amount from. Emily Spence is an aesthetic nurse in Chesterfield, and she is also diagnosed once upon a time as having body dysmorphic disorder. She thankfully has the insight and now the wisdom through this experience to be able to pass on some information and guidance that you can only get from someone in her very unique position. One of the hardest things with body dysmorphia is managing to communicate what you think might be going on in a way that doesn't cause further harm to your patient and in fact just puts them in a better, healthier place which is what medical professionals should be doing all the time. So I think we can learn something extremely unique through Emily's dual experience, both as a clinician and as a patient. And I hope it's gonna help you help your patients and help protect people with this disorder from further harm, which is no easy task as we will find out. So welcome, Emily. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's okay. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to share my story with you. As I've already said, I think the reason why I immediately wanted to have you on is because of this insight from both from both levels. And for me, I don't think most clinicians, they don't have a deep understanding of body dysmorphia. They have a superficial understanding of it. I'll give you one example, which is I think a lot of clinicians think anyone who asks for something that's bad taste is body dysmorphic. Mm. And even very prominent clinicians who will almost act as if they're an expert on body dysmorphia are actually talking about bad taste. Mm. And um, I know that you can give us the human story behind behind what looks like over-treatment and help us realize that they're, they're very different things. Because yeah. there are many people with who just don't have taste, who have treatments, or who are after different goals. Like I think some people want to look over-treated for reasons that they know they look over-treated. Mm -hmm. A bit like having a tattoo. You're not trying to look natural, you're trying to express an idea. And there are those patients. But really what I'm most concerned about is body dysmorphia because you end up in a, in a losing game where both people end up very unhappy, both the clinician and the patient, mm -hmm. unless you spot it early. And I know that you can help us do that. I think it's probably most interesting if we do just start with your with your story and tell us a little bit about before you got into aesthetics, your relationship with appearance, and then we'll lead up to the point where you had the insight to realize that you had BDD. Yeah, that's fine. So um, I think it started roughly when I was about 15. Um, I was obviously on social media that bit more, um, a bit going out, seeing my friends. So I felt like I had to kind of conform to a certain way um, I'd go to the gym quite a lot like it started once every other day and then I started going every day and then when I got to the age of like 16 um, I started going like two times a day and getting to the point where it was like um, a fixation of me wanting to go to the gym to lose weight like although I'd already done an hour on the treadmill I wanted to go again in the afternoon and do an hour. Like, it was obsessive. I weren't, like, anorexic or anything like that. I, I got to, like, probably a size six, uh, and I'm, like, five foot three and a, a bit, so it's not like I run away. Anyway, it started progressing that way. Obviously, I couldn't have treatments done because I was 16. Um, when I got to the age of 18, that's when I had my first lip filler, and then I went and had my breast done when I was 18. So as soon as I turned 18 in September, I went and had them done in the December. Um, and a person that I used to kind of look up to at that point was uh, Kate Price. Like obviously, looking back now, I don't know why I looked up to her at that time, but she was always on telling social media. And then it kind of started progressing. So... 
I'd wait a couple of months and then I'd go back and feel like I wanted to change myself and have more lip filler and then more lip filler. Um, I couldn't see that they were getting bigger. Like to me, I thought they were small, but like my family was saying that I'm changing myself and I don't look who I was years ago and I'm losing kind of my identity. And I used to just like brush it off and say like, oh, like shut up, like I'm fine. Um, I'd, I'd keep going. I'd have jaw filler, chin filler, cheek filler, nasolabial filler. And at that point, I didn't even have any indentations for them. But again, it was something that I fixated on. And then it was when I went to a practitioner in Stockport. Um, she said, during treatment, you're looking for perfection. It's something that you're not going to find. Like, we're all not perfect. And I was a bit like... What, what are you on about? Who, like, who do you think you are saying that to me as a, as a mm. patient? Um, and then she said, I think you may have like body dysmorphia. And I kind of just brushed it off a bit. So I didn't like initially realise straight away it wasn't something that I was like, wow, after that conversation, I'm going to take action. Do you know what I mean? I took it on board, but I was not angry but I, a bit disappointed that she said that to me. I then kind of kept having a few treatments after that. And then I got to a point, um, I was in a relationship that was like negative, it was toxic, um, and my self-worth was like diminishing. So I was then utilising more treatments. And I got to a point where I was like, I didn't, I didn't know who I were. When I looked in the mirror, I didn't see me. Um, I know I spoke to you a couple of weeks ago when I told you about when I went to the opticians and I tried some contacts on and I said, oh, it's weird, like, I'm, I know I'm looking at myself, but I don't see myself. And obviously I thought that was down to the contacts at that point, but it wasn't. It was the fact that I'd, like, um, detach myself from me as a person, that I couldn't see who I was. Um, so that's where it all started. During the journey, so when I started realising that I had a problem, I um, went to see some like private therapists. Like, yes, they were good. I could, I learned CBT off them, um, how to control like my negative um, thoughts. But in terms of myself, it was mainly my self-development that was able to pinpoint what caused it and where it started. I'd really like to explore the early days of it with you and the impact of social media and Katie mm -hmm. Price because so I, I've got young children now and I can I can see them observing the world and and trying to look for signals um, about what they need to do to survive would be the objective way of putting it. Um, you know, if they watch a lot of YouTube, they emulate the YouTube people and they want to they want me to record them playing computer games or video games as they call them um and then they think they're going to be mr beast and I, <laughs> i'm glad they're inspired but you know it's a very simplistic worldview when you're young and these people who put on a pedestal like katie i remember katie price and her heyday was everywhere and she was an, a, a symbol of feminine power mm -hmm. i mean she had a huge amount of it um so i can imagine how you your younger brain would have gone that's what I need to be like to survive. Can you tell us, can you remember more about what that was like seeing her and emulating her and what you thought you would get by pursuing her? Yeah, because I thought with her having obviously the big boobs and things like that, that I thought if I go and have um, a breast augmentation Sorry. that I would then um, become popular in a way or people would find me more attractive for having bigger breasts and things like that. I think because she was in such like the fame world, like everybody was all talking about Katie Price, that I thought that's something that I I used to look up to, that she was in the limelight, that she was getting places from having bigger boobs. Mm -hmm. Obviously now looking back, it was stupid for me to ever think that, but I think when you're constantly watching her shows as a like teenager initially you you do have that mindset of oh if I do that 
then I will become like her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to just watch her shows all the time, um, follow her on social media. Um, and when people used to like slag like her off or anything like that, I, I used to be like, why are they doing that? She's lovely and like backing her up all the time. And mm-hmm. I didn't even know her, but it was just my impression of her and how I perceived it, that that's what I wanted to follow. Mm-hmm. But no, it's not, it wasn't a good good way to go. Yeah. Um, but but I, I have to say in your defense, I think there's enormous power in appearance. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what we do in medical aesthetics is we help people achieve, but the key word is to achieve mm-hmm. power. And there's a point where you can go too far and you're actually diminishing your power. Mm-hmm. But um, she absolutely got a huge amount of additional privilege through the way that she commands attention through mm-hmm. appearance. And so you weren't wrong to say there's a power here which maybe I could get a piece of. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I, I mean, I think it's one of the most powerful forces is, is appearance. And I know people don't always like acknowledging that because there's this idea you should all be treated, mm-hmm. don't judge a book by its cover and all that stuff, which is great. But the, but the truth is we're visual creatures. And when you see something that's beautiful, it commands your attention and you can't, you can't ignore it. Mm-hmm. And it would be weird if we did. So you, your brain tapped into something that was real and you saw her way of being as a way that you can build a better life, which I don't think is an incorrect belief, actually. But there's something where it became, it became too unbalanced. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, do you, looking back, do you think it was inherently always unbalanced or did something develop over time? Was it something about the experience of seeing change that then made you want more of it? Or was it... I think it was... Um, effects of different things. If I take it back to around the time as when I was 15, I used to fancy this guy at school um, and they decided to make a joke of him asking me out, which I didn't know. So he then came over to me, asked me out, and then I said yes. They then told me it was a joke. So then I went away, like cried, I remember having like my mashed potato at dinner, just crying. Um, and I think that was like a belief that stuck with me, that made me feel um, like not worthy because they embarrassed me. Mm-hmm. So that I think that was something that stuck with me. And then um, another one was like my mum and dad broke up when I was around 15, 16. So then I then had this feeling of not feeling worthy because I felt like if I can't keep them together, I'm not no good. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there were all these little impacts that I think, obviously at that time, I didn't know that was Mm -hmm. the cause, but it was only from um, doing my self-development with me knowing that I had body dysmorphia and getting to the cause of the elements that triggered me to be that way. Um, And then again, a relationship that was toxic and um, affecting my self-worth um, and my values that then spiraled me to then want to make myself feel confident kept going for treatments um, and then you just kept kind of get lost because you're just looking for perfection because you're not loving yourself that's ultimately I think what body dysmorphia is it's about self-love and if you've not got it yeah you, you, you're very lost so that's super interesting. I, um, in my GP work, I still practice as a GP. I'm often trying to get down to one of those core beliefs mm. because when, when you deal with any mental health or even, even just normal interaction with your belief system in life, like I'm stressed at work, you can normally get down to a single idea that is driving everything. Mm. And that idea often slips in like unnoticed. And that, that story you told, someone did that to me at school as well. I was remembering it's a horrible feeling of feeling so excited that you're loved and then finding out it was all a, basically a mirage that people are doing to mock you. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, I remember it very, very well. And it really upset me as well. Now, for whatever reason, I, I didn't draw the same conclusion. I think I probably did on a level for a bit of brief,er period of time mm-hmm. of I'm, you know, I'm unlovable. That's everyone's worst fear. And sometimes it can help people to kind of realize that that we're all human and we actually all have the same thoughts Mm -hmm. but for whatever reason that thought got embedded deeper and started to drive behavior for longer and you also had a number of reinforcing experiences so the which happened first was it the experience with so there was the school experience and then it was obviously my mom and dad they uh, separated um 
and then obviously it was the toxic relationship. So they were all, obviously they were spaced apart, mm-hmm. or um, I think I could deal with the school problem and my mum and dad for a while. And then I think when I got into the toxic relationship, everything started to heighten. Do you mind sharing some of the general ways in which it was toxic? Partially physical um, and then emotionally abusive. So I'd say like I'd got ready to go out. Um, he'd call me a slag, said that, like, you're not going out like that. Like, who do you think you are? Rah, rah, rah. Like, basically just pulling me down. Then um, he got to a stage where he cheated on me um, and then I'd lost loads of weight from the stress of it all. Um, and then when I'd lost all that weight, he then was like, look at you, you're disgusting. Look how much weight you've lost. And and then I, I was like, well, you were saying negative things when I was a bit bigger. Bearing in mind, when I say a bit bigger, I was like an eight. But at that point when I'd lost weight, I'd gone to a six. Um, so I couldn't really win because even though I like lost a little bit more weight, he didn't like me before and didn't like me after. So I was like, well, what's wrong with me? Do you know what I mean? Mm. So everything was kind of like embedded in me that I was the issue. Um, I'm the problem. So it the kind of like my happiness was treatments. Mm-hmm. to make me feel that bit confident. Um, but they only lasted a short period of time. Like, I'd be happy for a couple of weeks and then I'd go again and have more. But no no practitioners during that point would ever say, no, I'm not treating you. They kept just treating me. Mm-hmm. We must get onto that as well. The bit that I'm hearing from you is you you actually, you obviously have a fair degree of creative power. Like you've got your own business, you, you, you're out there. When you, when you think you can achieve a goal, you go after it. Mm-hmm. But you're getting in this relationship where you're pursuing what you think is right to look beautiful a certain way. After all that effort, you get the exact opposite feedback, this word disgusting, which is a really powerful word. Like I can imagine that would really cut deep, yeah. um, especially when you're actually trying your best. You've got this context of previous things, but that, that was probably the low point, do you think? I'd probably say, yeah, that was the heightened point of it all Mm -hmm. because it was very personal. Obviously, in terms of like when I was younger, the problems with my mum and dad breaking up, I know that wasn't my fault. It was just that they went separate ways um, and I couldn't stop that. But in terms of like the direct comments in a relationship, Mm -hmm. that cuts deep because I didn't have that from my mum or dad or I didn't have that from that time at school Mm -hmm. they were just jokes and so yeah that was probably the height of it all hence why I went and got more and more procedures yeah do you think there's was this a kind of narcissistic type personality Mm. you're dealing with yeah Yeah, so I actually like I think it was a few months after I got out of that relationship I started delving into like narcissistic behaviors and so actually when I went to do my nursing degree. That's when I found out he cheated on me. So I had to start my nursing degree, but it didn't stop me. It just meant that my head was a bit all over the place because I was trying to resolve that and how I felt and then also do my nursing. But I kind of just implemented all my energy to get to where I wanted to be and do my nursing and try and get over my body dysmorphia at that time and help others throughout life with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I did it. So, yeah. Well, yeah. well done. You're, you're clearly using the the pain to drive you forward, which is it can either drive you down or up. So you're, you're on the up. So it will be useful for people to understand those relationships. But if you meet an empathic person um, and they get involved with a narcissist, that's that's the worst case scenario yeah. for the empath. Yeah. So if, if you're someone who um, is looking to please, to try to find what the formula is so that you get the love that you want and we all need, but you meet a narcissist, that, that's often when people really go into abusive stages because a narcissist just cares about winning, being being the one who in every interaction comes out on top. And, and that's what you experience. What basically, when you become very beautiful for a narcissist, it, it can tip into threat. Mm. So, it, But it's hard for people to realise that. It's, it's weird that you say that because initially um, I was put on a pedestal like 
oh, this is my beautiful girlfriend, da 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 carry a photo of me around in his wallet and this, that and the other. And then when I started wanting to go out to do my thing, that's when the problems started occurring. And that's when the control kind of comes in. And ultimately, that's what they want to do, just break you down so you feel like you've got no self-worth. But I didn't mention when I was 15, around 15, when I was going to the gym all the time, I used to binge eat, so I used to eat loads of food and then I'd make myself sick the odd times because I didn't want to gain weight. But I was never bulimic or anorexic. It was just that I did it the odd time because of my body dysmorphia, because of how my mind was working. It was just obsessed on my appearance, basically. Mm -hmm. So so let's make that real um, because I think it's one of the key ways that you will pick up body dysmorphia, the thinking driving the behavior. Because like we said earlier, you can't actually tell by looking at someone's face whether they have dysmorphia because it's more about the what's driving the behavior. So what was it like on a normal day? Well, not let's say not a normal day, on a bad day when you were thinking about these things a lot, what, how would your day start and how would it play out? When I was like 15, 16, it went that bad because I couldn't go and have treatments and things like that. I could only go to the gym. So it would just be in my routine that I'd go to the gym every day. But then it started getting um, to the point where I'd restrict my food. I'd not want to eat all day. And then that's when I binged eat because I felt like I was so hungry. But then I felt guilt. I felt guilty for eating the food. So then I'd make myself sick. And it was like a bit of a cycle. Like my thought patterns, I'd be watching telly and my head's thinking, you can't go and eat anything because you don't want to put weight on. Or I'd have like, um, I don't know, my lips are too small or it'd be a constant thought of my body image that would be coming up every hour. And then even as I kept um, developing with it, when I got to like 21, uh, 22, that's when it was like at its height. I'd be thinking constantly about my lips. I'd need more lip filler. I need to change this. I need to change that. Would that be on a right, almost on all a day, day long? Yeah. Right? And would you how how often would you be looking in the mirror and thinking about it? I don't think I was too bad in terms of looking in the mirror. I'd look in the mirror, but I would be like thinking about things that I wanted to change. But I would avoid the mirrors at times. Or like if somebody wants to take a photo of me, I would be like, oh no, don't take one because my hair's a mess or um, my makeup's not done right or just avoiding it. Mm -hmm. um, because when somebody took a picture of me, I didn't see what I was looking at. I didn't see that that was me. When you did see a photo of you or, or a reflection in the mirror, how, what, what emotions would come up at that point? I would pick at it. I'd say, oh, look, I look fat. Or Did you feel it any negative emotion was it kind of an aesthetic challenge or did you feel a sense of disgust or negativity what how would you describe it I felt just like not worthy disgusted it that that was me like do you know I didn't see value in it but obviously throughout my journey um I realized that you've got to go on the journey of self-love to overcome body dysmorphia mm. and realise that things that have happened in your life, it's not because you're not worthy or anything like that. I, I'm, I'll utilise them as lessons because if I didn't have them, I wouldn't have been able to overcome them mm. or it to trigger me to then overcome it. And I wouldn't be here to be able to share it to help others either. Absolutely. I was in my mid-30s before I realised that negative emotion was just information to respond to. It didn't actually mean it's like a driving force. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see it that way, you think, what can I learn? What do I need to do in order to overcome it rather than avoiding it or pretending that there's some other problem? Just feedback, really. So just going back to in those, the, the time in your early 20s, you're, you're looking in the mirror, you're getting that sense of I, every time you look, you're thinking I'm not worthy, but maybe if I change something, I will become unworthy. But I'm, the thoughts I'm sure weren't that verbal but they were it's that kind of emotional yeah that's driver. basically what I used to do I'd have treatment done feel good for a few weeks and then it was the next thing like oh I need to have more I need mm. more I need more and then I got to a point where I remember taking a picture of myself and thought that doesn't even look like me like that's crazy and then it started to make me realize and I flicked back through all my pictures 
to where I was when I was 18 to who I was at 25. And they, they look completely different. So, so that's a key moment because that was the moment where you became insightful about a, the appearance side of things. Whatever goal you were unconsciously pursuing, you hadn't, you'd achieved something else that you didn't want either. So what did that make you question? Did you question whether you should have more treatment or change the treatment? Or did you think maybe you should stop having treatment? I decided to stop having treatment and dissolved. Obviously, looking back, my dad would always say, you don't need it. My mum used to make comments. My mum's never had aesthetic treatment. She's a bit against it, shall we say. Um, but I always tell her, you can have natural. You don't have to have fake. But anyway, she always used to say a lot of comments in terms of my appearance. I realised that I should have listened to them back then, but I couldn't see past it. I, my head wasn't in the right frame of mind to be able to understand where they were coming from. So, yeah, now I know. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, th I think it's not just you, it's all of us. Like we have our own version of how things work in our head and our f people around us will give you, particularly if they're older or a man, you are like, what do you know about mm. beauty or what young people need to do these days? So it's very easy to dismiss. And it's only like when it finally clicks that you, you sort of realize that your people are trying to tell you the information that you need. So it is hard, but that we all have those, those little barriers of what do you know? Um, you're not me and it's not your life and all those sort of things. But they were trying to help. It just didn't feel like that until you'd, until you'd made the realization yourself. And I think that's one of the, that's probably the thing I'm most inter interested in is as a practitioner, how do you help people make the realization or at least not make the situation worse? It's very hard because you at least had developed insight, but at one point you didn't have insight. And body dysmorphia is classified partly according to insight, how insightful people are. And it's one of the things that makes it nearly impossible. If you meet a, a patient who has zero insight, like they are 100% convinced that the problem is on their face. Knowing what you know now, tell us a little bit about how you might have a conversation with that patient. So obviously if I was to have a conversation with a patient, I would utilize my personal experience to make them aware that I am understanding of how they feel. But I think for a, a practitioner that hasn't got that insight, they can obviously utilize the, the information that they've gathered from the body dysmorphia questions to screen them. Explain to the patient that um, as they're aware they use ethical uh, values that are in the best interest for the clients. Explain that they care about their patient's mental health and well-being. Discuss that they may have uh, something called body dysmorphia and discuss what body dysmorphia is. Explain where they can refer the patients on to. To just explain that it's not about the money. Um, as a practitioner, it's about the safety and the patient well-being, mental health, that's more important. It's not to say that they won't ever have treatment, but just to explain that right now um, you're just not treating and it's better to seek uh, advice and guidance from a medical practitioner who can diagnose. My situation when somebody mentioned it to me was a bit different because I didn't really get that. I just had, you're looking for perfection, but you're not really going to find it. So it's a bit like, mm, what's that meant to me? And I'm trying to fizz through it to try and understand it. Um, and then obviously I went off to look up body dysmorphia. So I didn't really get the whole insight with it all. Although that practitioner didn't did it in a clunky way, they were pivotal. Like mm -hmm. by them being honest at that moment, even though they didn't finesse the moment brilliantly, they actually were, were they did the right thing and mm. they helped. Yeah, because it stuck with me. Even yep. though I didn't initially reflect and solve the problem then, I did it mm. a few years on. Yeah. And I looked back at that point, that that was the point where it twigged, right. that they realized that I had something. So you, you've, you've actually gone through a framework that I use in GP and in complaints, uh, which you've arrived at with your own experience, which is that you started off by um, empathizing with them. And you can do that in a way that not everyone can because you've actually lived it. Mm -hmm. It was a really useful tip in that, which is people can't disagree with a story I, it's a very I use this all the time um, if I ever start telling a story and you're a patient sorry I'm probably trying to influence you but <laughs> it's because um, if I start saying what I think you your, in, your brain instantly goes into well I, that's not what I think mm -hmm. whereas if I start telling you a story it's just it's you can't disagree with it it just is a thing that happened so once I had a thought in my head that I wasn't enough and I pursued treatment and it made me go too far 
No one can disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And it's a very useful thing, even if it's, you don't have the personal experience, you can tell stories of other people. Uh, and I find that that's a very useful tip, which is you, you get them to think about alternative ways of, because basically our brains are storytelling devices. So we're always trying to string together a series of events and make sense of them. Uh, like you did when you were young, you made, you tried to make sense of it by saying, if I improve myself, I can solve all the other problems, mm -hmm. which also includes the fact that you're not enough. And that actually works. You know, you can accomplish a huge amount. It's just that you never accomplish fulfillment and happiness. And that's what you've learned is to rewire that and make a different story. So that's why stories are so powerful. You essentially can use your story and that practitioners listening to this could use your story as well, which I know of uh, people without mentioning names who've gone through this experience. And it just starts to twig them in a different way. The other thing about stories is that they're non-judgmental. And I think one of the biggest problems I see in the industry is the judgment of, of BDD as, because, because if you don't, here's the reason, if you don't know how to handle it, you feel disempowered and you feel weak and you've got to deal with these crazy patients who, who make, you, make your life difficult and so you get contempt for them. And that's the worst case situation. Really what you want to do is bring what you're helping us do, which is the understanding and kindness to gently edge them back on, onto course. So I mean, I do think if they are in denial and they can't see it, they will probably still be um, a bit annoyed that mm -hmm. you've mentioned something because if they're not going to have treatment but they want treatment, potentially they could be a bit upset about it. But I think the best way is as a practitioner to not do the treatment because at the end of the day you're thinking about them and their mental health and well-being and at that moment in time they're not able to see mm -hmm. the bigger picture of it all because they, they don't have the awareness on their um, disorder there's different heights of body dysmorphia as well like I think mine was on like the higher scale of body dysmorphia not in terms of me going and having every surgical procedure going because I've just had my, my breast augmentation and that was I'm 30 now so I was 18 so it's 12 years ago and that's the only surgery that I've had. So people think when you have body dysmorphia that you have to have loads of surgery to have it. And I think that's wrong because it's not about that. It's about the thought process. If you're having obsessive thoughts about body image and utilising dermal fillers or going to the gym excessively, they are contributing signs mm -hmm. to body dysmorphia. So I think people can get confused and think, well, I don't, I don't go and have all these procedures done. It, it's not just down about the procedures. It's about how your mind's obsessing over your body image and how you're feeling and how it's affecting your day. And just going to the gym every day and feeling guilt for not going to the gym can be a sign. Yeah, I think it's a really important part of your message, which is it's not about what you can see. It's what's going on what's driving, mm -hmm. even if the behavior, because it could even just be makeup. You could be dysmorphic and just obsess over makeup. Um, and that's at least doesn't, doesn't cause accumulated injury or, or damage like overtreatment or surgery might, but it's still the same pattern of thought mm -hmm. that's, that's got someone trapped. So you have to explore your patient's thoughts and not just what they look like. I've had a patient once, I remember years ago, who I was... I made the, this mistake. I looked at her in the waiting room and was like, she's dysmorphic mm -hmm. because she'd had so much treatment. And when I had a good chat with her, she just was someone who would, whatever a practitioner would say, she would just do it. Mm -hmm. And she'd been seeing a practitioner for ages who was just repeating ba bad treatments and had made her look terrible. And all I did was fix that and she was happy and she, she didn't have dysmorphia, but she looked like someone who was obsessed. Mm -hmm. But she was actually someone who's too compliant with a practitioner who was just repeating I'm not saying they're a bad person, but they, they, weren't, they weren't creating an aesthetic goal. They were just vending machines, repeating the same treatment. So that's super useful to understand for clinicians. I'm interested in how, how far down the road we can go in terms of exploring the very resistant patient. And so because you've, you've said the, the story is very interesting. The next thing you said, which I really love, is that you're, you're basing your rejection of their treatment on the fact that you care about them, not that you care about your business and your reputation. Because this is something else that I was also taught in the early days, which is you say to your patient, at the end of the day, it's my reputation, <laughs> which is a very selfish reason not to treat someone. And it might be your, one of your goals, but really 
that makes the patient feel contempt. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you've said is, I care about you and I need to do the right thing that's best for your overall health. Now, the problem is they are dis they're going to disagree with you at this point and say, I'm, I'm not, I just need just a little bit more in my whatever. Tell us about how you might approach that if I'm arguing with you and now saying, I think you're wrong about this. Can I just have one more middle of lip fill? I promise you I'll be happy after that, which is something I've heard many times. I will be happy after this. In that kind of circumstance, I would say to them, like, look, I think you're really beautiful the way you are. You don't need to have any more treatments. Um, obviously, I've explained the signs and symptoms that you are showing. I'm not diagnosing you at all. I'm just making you aware that these signs and symptoms can be body dysmorphia. Um, utilise my uh, insight with my own personal story so they can see that I'm on the same, same wavelength. If they kept trying to go with me to do a treatment, I would just be outright and just say... I'm not going to treat you. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this why, should show you... why dis just because I've got body dysmorphia, can't I just have one more treatment? Because if you're not happy with how you are inside and how you view yourself right now, with me treating you with one meal extra, how is that going to make a difference if you can't value yourself now mm -hmm. and feel content? It's, it's not. It's futile, yeah. So I, th I think that's, that, that is similar to the line that I eventually get to as well, which is... The purpose of my treatments is to make you feel happy, fulfilled, so that you can go out and live your life. And the, the more I've spoken to you or got to know you, the more I realize that, that these treatments are not achieving that. So you're having a treatment, but you're actually either less fulfilled or the same. Mm -hmm. You're never free from the concern, which means I'm doing a procedure that has no benefit. Mm -hmm. Because the real, and this is something that I think a lot of practitioners don't think enough about, which is that the only real benefit of aesthetic treatments the primary one is that the patient feels more confident and able to go and do behaviors that are healthy, like yeah. build relationships, apply for jobs, all those things, feel confident. And if you're doing a procedure and not achieving that, you're actually taking a physical, a medical risk for no benefit. Mm -hmm. So it's quite useful. It's quite a useful way, um, which fits perfectly with your philosophy of saying, I'm responsible for your overall health. And I don't have enough evidence to say that a treatment is actually going to be good for your health. I might be wrong, which is another thing I love about what you said, which you've, you're very humble in, I'm not diagnosing you, because what I'm hearing with that is, I'm not judging you. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, I might, you're saying I might be wrong, but I don't have the confidence to take this risk with your health, because the way I've assessed things means it makes me feel like I might be doing a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And... That is so much easier to hear than, I think you're a bad person for asking. You're obviously crazy. You've been tricked by social media and all those things which any you know teenage girl would just be like, what do you know? And they would dismiss it and they'll go next door. And that's the real opportunity here is, when you've been through it, I mean, how would you rate the the degree of suffering that you went to before you realized? Like, how what were those years like for you? I mean, they were really bad, if I'm honest. Like, I got to a point where I used to cry and not want to be here anymore like I obviously had suicidal thoughts and things like that I never went to the GP and spoke about it just because I was very aware that they didn't understand body dysmorphia they weren't a lot like years ago in terms of body dysmorphia that's why I'm so passionate in terms of talking about it and helping people be aware of it because they can sometimes think it's just depression and it's not because it's fixated on how you view yourself and how you feel about yourself I, I don't I wanted to tell tell you about obviously when I um got out of the toxic relationship I then went to do things to make myself feel more confident so I did a swimsuit competition and it went through um like our local newspaper and loads of people online were just like cyber bullying me like calling me out for my lips at that point because I had bigger lips and um saying like duck lips or like look at her like just slating me all over online and I remember people sending it me and then I'd be like reading it crying my eyes out ringing my sister going home um just like not wanting to be here um and then they then made another newspaper article about cyberbullying because they looked at how many comments were made in terms of like what was being said and they didn't think it was fair. Um, and obviously my views on it is I think it's horrendous because I only did that um, 
swimsuit competition because I wanted to gain more self-confidence because I'd been through a toxic relationship but I was also suffering with body dysmorphia so for me that was a big thing for me to take the leap to get myself out there to make a change but I also got criticized for doing that and they didn't know my story like now um I wouldn't get upset about it but I think because I was in the midst of my body dysmorphia still it kind of took hold and then mm. I felt like I was just going back to square one yeah I mean that is horrendous I think the thing with cyberbullying that is I, th I think our brains are basically I think I've heard this we're wired to live in a tribe of sort of a hundred to a thousand mm. and in a tr if you lived in a tribe of a hundred people and one of them had a negative point of view it would really matter mm. um, because they're one of a network that you rely on whereas social media is basically the whole world but our brain still sees that one person as quite important. So you feel, even though they're not really, it's, it's just some, some guy on the toilet who probably actually doesn't have a girlfriend and wish, wishes you were his girlfriend who decides to drop some, some, some negative comment to make himself feel better. Um, and, but, it, but our brains interpret that as much more important of a signal than it really is. And that can, that's what creates such a horrible stress for people. Well, negative situations or anything that impacts self-worth or like how you view yourself, that they can all um, exacerbate body dysmorphia. So like them online bullies at that time, that heightened my body dysmorphia where I felt like I needed to go and get more things, but also to the point of not wanting to be around. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that's why it's so important to not even, when somebody's had a lot of procedures done, to not take the mick out of them and make a joke because deep down it's causing them so much pain and suffering that they might even not know why they feel that way. Yeah. So if, you, if the people listening to this can be the kind of practitioner that ends that cycle, mm -hmm. you might save someone years of misery. You know, and I think that's a worthwhile thing to take home from this. And because, and you also, as much as your first practitioner didn't didn't do it well, uh, as well as you might, I, I have to say they they did say something truthful, which is hard. I don't think I actually think the average practitioner tries not to say the word um, because it, because of the risk of rejection and upset and negative reviews. And so, uh, in a in a way, I, I think they they did a great job just saying it. And I, I've I've learned the hard way as well that you know the, in the long arc of things, the only true only true friend you have in the consultation is the truth. Like you have to say what you think is true because if you gloss over something, it it comes back, grows into something else later. Hopefully, we've made a really good case of why it's important to have the awkward conversation and the benefit that you can do to that patient, especially when you do it with kindness and non-judgmentally. Uh, a degree of being humble as well because we don't know for sure and as you've said it's easier to hear as a suggestion rather than a conclusion or a question more than a suggestion really the and then your own personal boundary of i'm not going to retreat because i don't feel confident i'm not you know you i might be wrong but i i don't want to create make matters worse and the money doesn't matter to me as much as your health and well-being is a, is a fantastic message which is great you'll, you'll make your money back through good reputation if you do that the final bit really to explore is i'd really like to understand how you've broken the cycle and what what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis that enables you to to basically break the cycle because i'm sure it, the thoughts must pop up occasionally because thoughts do in everyone's head yeah they tend to say that body dysmorphia you don't get rid of it completely throughout your life there'll always be kind of something in your life that may trigger the emotion to come up during the time of overcoming it i was utilizing uh, self-development books like self-love how to love yourself how to gain more confidence uh, one big thing that people do with body dysmorphia is compare themselves to others so they see somebody i'm like i need to look like her so that, because they don't look like them they have the obsession of they're not valuable enough. So that's where the compare comes in. And I used to do that a lot. Like I'd go on social media, I'd see something, I needed that, I needed to have that hair or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so now what I do when I go on social media, I have taken off the accounts that are not valuable to me in terms of following people I don't know. Um, and looking at these fake lifestyles because ultimately it puts like the vision in your head that you need to kind of strive for that life 
And it's okay to, if you want to strive for that life, you can still do that, but you don't have to compare yourself. I limit social media time. So obviously when I'm on social media, it's made nine times out of 10, it's just my business. It's not my personal account. And I just make sure that I'm talking to myself kindly. Like I don't go to the gym anymore. Um, not not because I ban myself it's just because I've got a two and a half year old and I never get get round to going so yeah um, they're the kind of things that I do if I get negative thoughts like that I'm gaining weight or anything like that I just listen to the emotion and then I'll do change um, the way I'm doing something so if I've been having takeaways for the past four days which I did last week I would then have healthier meals like not not eat I wouldn't not eat um so it's just being mindful and adapting the way you think and that's about and, it and I mean the other thing I see you doing is that you're using the pain to teach others and you've, you've written this ebook which will make available to others as well um because I sometimes think so if you base your identity on on appearance and comparisons I mean that's essentially one way of looking at it is that you're comparing yourself to the illusion of someone else's life. Like even Katie Price, a great example of like, <laughs> you know, in those days that you're referring back to, she would have, she looked like she had it all. Mm. Um, and now you can see it playing out differently and it's harder. You know, she's got a complex life um, and she she hasn't got all her problems solved and she doesn't look as good as she, in, in the airbrush pictures as she might in a normal picture because she's human. So you've separated out um, that comparison and uh, but you're but you're also what I love about what you're doing is that you're you're actually developing something that's nothing to do with appearance. It's a it's more about your mission, which is you now have a mission to uh, help other people in in that situation, which which then builds an identity that's that's completely separate to how you look, because mm -hmm. we're all playing a story in our mind about who we are and how we fit in, and sometimes the pain forces you to generate a new story, and that's why that's what I, I can see that you're doing, which is there's a there's a new story that isn't about whether you look good enough to be worthy of love. It's actually about what you're doing for others. I always say, if you didn't have pain, you wouldn't have growth. If you didn't have heartache, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know how love felt. Do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely, So you yeah. have to have the opposites to get the benefits. Um, one thing I wanted to say is online, um, do you know with aesthetic practitioners, um, marketing, like I personally don't use celebrity images because I don't want my patients to be comparing themselves to celebrities and think that they have to look that way. Same with like Kim K packages and things like that. It's hard because I think if practitioners are marketing using Kim K packages, the patients ultimately come in and thinking in their head they're going to leave looking as sculpted as Kim K is. Do you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And then my thing is, is why would you want to look like Kim K and why is a practitioner allowing somebody to look like them? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's odd. And, and worse than that is that a lot of the images of her are so airbrushed mm. and processed that it's not even what she looks like anyway. Mm. So you can't buy you can't buy that in the form of filler. You need a professional mm. studio and a photographer and then you'll get a picture, but you still won't look like that in real life. Mm. Yeah. So and and but once more, that's another one of the the problems with the internet and our how our brains are wired is that we think that image is a real person and None of them look like that when you see them in real life. I think it's a it's usually a bit of disappointment if you bump into them. I mean, you'd be excited, but it's not. They don't look like they do in the images. So that is a f also another fantastic thing because what you're doing there is just realigning people people's expectations with something that's actually ach achievable. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, it's it's linked with dysmorphia in that you're always pursuing a hologram that when you get there, it disappears. It's not attainable. Mm -hmm. So you're saving people a lot of angst and wasted money and risk because they're not pursuing something that they will never get anyway mm -hmm. by just grounding them in something more real. One of the more interesting things about body dysmorphia is that I think we all, we, it's a fine line between someone who has it and someone who doesn't. And it's not, it's not always as black and white as people think because what's the difference between an obsessive thought that's 10 times a day and one that's five times a day or once a week or like what, where do you draw the line? Um, I think if you've got obsessive thoughts that crop up every day, you're probably on the spectrum of mm -hmm. body dysmorphia. In terms of body image, like how you view yourself, things that you want to change, or going to the gym, if that's an obsessive thought about your gym and how you manage your weight, that's kind of on the spectrum bit. But 
I think in terms of having low self-confidence, if you think about it, say you just put on a bit of weight and you want to want to um, lose a bit. If you just have that thought, but you do something about it and then start to feel better, that's fine. You can have negative thoughts about yourself. It's when they're recurring and you're thinking about them daily that affects your social life. Like, I used to go out with my friends, but I would think I was fat and it would stop me from enjoying myself because I was thinking I was fat all the time. So they're the differences in terms of if it's affecting you're not being present in the moment, you're thinking of all these intrusive thoughts, that's that's when it's bad. But again, I think there's different heights to it. You can start off with a very like minimal um, thoughts and then it starts progressing mm-hmm. to a bigger yeah it's definitely a journey and I think this is the bit that I find hardest is that there you if you meet someone who's in between lots of things you need other mechanisms as well right? and so one of the things I find useful is to say that I to just say I feel unsure like I'm in between about whether you should have treatment or not mm-hmm. because at least you've then said it and it makes it much easier later on to have the discussion of now I'm sure <laughs> um, and also you can also frame in people's minds what like what the, what the actual outcome is so I if I'm going to do a treatment I'm going to do, redo your lips which I think they're okay I could probably make an argument to do a little bit more but if unless you're happier and by that objectively you'd look for the next stage which is are you doing the things in your life that a healthy person would do if you felt great mm-hmm. like are you bo- building relationships are you if you want to go internet dating or something or whatever the example is of the of the step into the the discomfort zone in life which we all have to do all the time that you can now do because i we did the treatment if you're doing those things then you can keep being a patient but if you keep coming back not doing those things and still unhappy Mm. and hoping that the next treatment will do it then i have to draw a line on it yeah i forgot to say that one um so when you've got body dysmorphia one thing that tends to come with it is ocd um so like if you get patients in clinic and they've got OCD I would be asking them like questions in terms of body dysmorphia screening tool how like do they think about their image daily how often do they go to the gym because OCD you fixate on things and obviously it can correlate to body dysmorphia not always but if somebody did have OCD it's worth asking questions yeah and you cover all of this in much more detail in your book mm-hmm. is that correct so tell our audience where they can follow you and how they can get hold of that um so you can go on to www.ourmentalaesthetics.com um, and the ebook is on there it's cpd accredited and um, you get a certification and cpd minutes your instagram handle Almento aesthetics so it's a-l-m a-u-m-e-n-t-o aesthetics okay and we'll probably link that in our show notes and um, wherever else this goes. So it should come back to you. So if you want to learn more about this topic, then there's a whole book written on it from someone who has a very unique perspective. I think it's super valuable. Um, and for that reason, that's why I really wanted to have you on. So thank you so much for making the drive down here. It's all right. Thank you for having um, me. No, it's been a real pleasure. And I, and I think it's really valuable what you're doing. So thank keep you. going.